it was a few days later that, um, that uh, two older friends and I headed out to the Panther office. And I wanted to be part of the most militant organization on the scene. And of course, the Black Panther Party stood way at the forefront. They had been patrolling the streets of Oakland, California with guns and law books. They stormed the state capital, you know, when the, when, and then when the authorities uh, were about to change the laws because that, the, the law that said that you could carry a gun in Oakland, California, uh, as long as it wasn't concealed and you didn't uh, have a criminal record, uh, they didn't mean black guys with leather coats. <laughs> and the Panthers responded by something that we would call a colossal event. They stormed the state capitol of Sacramento. And I had, you know, gone to school right after the riots and I announced to my friends that I was going to be a black militant. And uh, my buddies that always, we ate lunch together, I was a hall monitor, so there was a group of us. And one of my best friends uh, looked at me, his name was Paul, Paul, Paul Kirshen, a white kid, a Jewish kid. And he said, um, Eddie, I don't know if you can announce you're going to be a black militant like it's a career choice. <laughs> like you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, no, Paul, you watch. You watch, I'm going to be a militant. So I had to find the most militant organization it was. And there were the Panthers storming the state capital of Sacramento, reading the manifesto about black people's right to defend themselves. And then the news reporter came on and said, the ultra-militant Black Panther Party. Oh boy, there was that word, not only militant, ultra-militant. And then he said, and the Panthers' car was pulled over, and there were guns <clears throat> and communist literature found in the trunk. And I'm looking at grandma's black and white TV, and I'm going, they crazy. They crazy, they got leather coats. They stormed the Capitol with the white legislatures. They had communist literature, they so crazy. I want to join that one. <laughs> so we traveled to what was the secret headquarters of the Black Panther, but we thought it was secret. Of course, the Panthers opened community uh, programs and offices all over, but to us it was the secret headquarters. Didn't know what we were quite getting into. And on the train ride out, my older friends are trying to psych, well, well, mainly to psych me out. I guess they thought if I got off the train, they had an excuse to get off too. So one friend leans over and he goes, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know the Panthers is like the mafia, right? <laughs> Once you get in, there's no getting out. I can't be a punk in front of my boy, so I'm like, I don't care. Another guy leans over, he says, uh, yo, you know you gotta kill a white dude to be a Panther. <laughs> Kill somebody? I'm an honor student, a choir boy. But I gotta be tough, I don't care. And the other friend leans over, he says, no man, get it straight, get it straight. You don't have to kill a white dude. I relaxed. He said, you gotta kill a white cop. <laughs> and you have to bring in his badge and his gun. Well, my, my heart is pounding. We get to the Panther office. There's that great Black Panther Party uh, sign on the outside, all these great, uh, Black Panthers are there, these brothers and sisters with their leather coats and army fatigue jackets and berets and some of the sisters have their heads wrapped up in, in gay lays and I sit in the back and the brother who at the front is giving what we call a PE class, political education, and he's going through the Panther 10 point program and it's points like we want freedom, the power to determine the destiny of our community, full employment for our people, decent housing, fit for shelter for human beings, nothing about killing a white guy. Nothing about bringing a cop's badge and go, am I hearing this? No, I'm still back on the train wanting to be a man. So I jump up in the middle of him talking about the 10 point program and I go, choose me brother. Ah, oh, me, I kill a white dude right now. <laughs> Whole meeting stops. He says, come here young brother. Pulls open the bottom drawer of the desk and he reaches in and he's reaching so far, far down, my heart is pounding in my chest and I'm trying to be cool, but I'm thinking to myself, look how far down he's reaching in the desk. He's gonna give me a big damn gun. <laughs> and he comes up with a stack of books and his Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver, the autobiography of Malcolm X, Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. And I'm standing there confused and I figure this must be a test. And I go, brother, I thought you were gonna arm me. And he said, young brother, I just did. As I'm walking back to my seat, he said, young brother, I'm like, now what? Because now I'm embarrassed. He said, let me ask you a question, because you came in here talking about you want to kill white folks. 
He said, of all of the cops who are out here beating people up, shooting them down, brutalizing them, if they were all black and the people being victimized and killed were white, if all of the store owners in the community were black and the people being ripped off with high prices and having to deal with rotten vegetables and spoiled meat, if they were white, and then he got a little pant on me, he said, and all these job time, demagogic, fascist pig politicians. <laughs> he said, if all of them were black and the people being exploited and oppressed were white, would that make things correct? At this time, I answered with a little bit of my brain instead of my bruised ego, and I said, no, brother, it seems like it would still be wrong. And he said, that's right. He said, this is a class struggle for human rights, not just a race struggle. Study those books so you understand what the revolution is about. 